Brethren, in the work, most of you know this, but we've had excellent prospective member growth. More and more prospective members are coming along all the time, all over the world, frankly. And uh, we also have a wonderful response to the telecast, and that's been coming in again, about 3,500 uh, to 5,000 responses uh, every single week. And we read about some others where they get 5,000 or 10,000 a year, and uh, we are growing much, much faster, have a far, far greater impact in this work that Christ is doing through us. So at the end of this age, in spite of our problems, and some of us are getting older and we have strokes or like this man had this heart attack and we need to pray for him and for everyone that has these things, we still have an awful lot to be thankful for. We really do. Most all of us here in this nation, we have plenty of food and we have plenty of clothing. We have a comfortable place to stay and we have peace. And when my wife and I watch the BBC News or even some of the other newscasts and we see people being brutalized and beaten up and shot and all this kind of thing all over the world, it helps me realize that I need to thank God for the United States of America and for you brethren who are still living in Britain or Canada or Australia or many of those places, you should be thankful too. We have the blessings still of the sons of Joseph, a great deal of peace, and we can be very thankful for that. We also could be thankful that we have the opportunity uh, to be part of the greatest crusade, perhaps the greatest, we'll have to see how it turns out, but certainly one of the greatest crusades in human history as God's true church prepares the way for the King of Kings, for the return of the most magnificent event in 6,000 years of human history when the heavens will literally be shaken and every mountain and every island shaken out of its place and the last trumpet sounds and Christ comes back to this earth. And we have the way, the opportunity today to prepare the way for that. And I hope we're thankful for that. It's going to require struggle, it's going to require overcoming, it's going to require sacrifice, but we have that opportunity and we're laying up treasure in heaven forever and ever and ever if we do our part. So I hope we can get our mind on that. But brethren, we are still, that is this work of God, we're still unknown. When I walk around Charlotte, even now occasionally going into store, when I was recently a few months ago going into the Y or here or there, most people don't know who we are at all. And all of you are aware of that. And all the Church of God groups on earth all put together are still basically unknown. You know, we walk the streets of Chicago or New York or L.A. or London or Buenos Aires or wherever it might be, and we're unknown. They don't know who we are. We have not done enough of a work to have a, an impact yet. And yet God indicates many times, I'm just going to give you one or two here, but many times that a really powerful work was to be done at the time of the end. So I want all of you to realize that we're just starting. No matter what happens to me or any other guys that are getting older in their 70s or 80s or 90s, you've got to keep your minds on the big picture. The true church of God is going to perform a very, very powerful work. And we want to have our hearts in that work. Because as I say, if we do the work as best we can while we're here, while we have the opportunity, we are laying up treasure for all eternity. And it is a tremendous opportunity that we have. A tremendous work is to be done. Turn back to Matthew 24 in your New Testaments, if you would here. I want to just mention something I've noted a number of times, but this really proves that when you think about it, other scriptures talk about it as well, of course, many other scriptures, and I won't have time to have a whole sermon on that. But in Matthew 24, he's talking about false prophets and rumors of war, and, and then he says, verse 7, about the signs of Christ's second coming, for a nation will rise up against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, world war, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. I noticed in your church bulletin today, it talks about a terrible drought and famine and food shortages in, in China. And they're having those all over the world. Now, we've always emphasized it's going to be here, and it is going to be here. But it doesn't say that in this verse. In other words, they're going to be, Jesus said, they're going to be terrible drought and famine and, and food shortages, disease epidemics on earth more than ever. And they are really, really beginning to occur just because they haven't started here yet big time. 
does not mean this prophecy is not being fulfilled. They are going to be fulfilled here as well. That is definitely indicated, but they are beginning to happen. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Not the end, but the beginning. Then they will deliver you, that is Christ's disciples. He was talking to his disciples then and now. And kill uh, up to tribulation and kill you. Some of us will be killed and some of us will die of old age perhaps before that time too. We know that. And you brethren who are younger, you should not sorrow in a wrong way. It doesn't mean you don't be sorry, but we should not sorrow as others who have no hope. We do have hope. What is our hope? The resurrection from the dead, which is very real. So we want to believe that and know that. God is not going to let all of us live to be 100 years old. And I think we have figured that out. But you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And brethren, for all the nations to hate the people of God, the people of God have got to be known. And undoubtedly the way the people of God, the true church of God, is going to be known because it will be doing a powerful work. It will be doing a work of such significance that it will be finally in the headlines and it will be on the major newscasts and mentioned here and there, normally in a bad way, but it will be mentioned. And so we need to understand that that has not yet taken place. A much, much bigger work. We were talking in a board meeting earlier this week about carrying on and perhaps having even a few students here next autumn in the Living University. And we can't add a lot, but our, our whole budget for the Living University is less than 1%, less than 1% of the budget. Tiny portion compared to what Mr. Armstrong did, but we are reaching over 100 students around the world, and we are having an impact in the church in that way, and we're going to have a far greater impact as this grows on. And of course, we're going to have to do a great deal more work, and so as more students shine up for the Living University classes, some of our elders uh, we've begun to hire here, such as Mr. Wyatt Seselker, and many others have taken these classes, and they are ahead because of that, because they have been already deacons or elders, but by taking these detailed classes, you know, significant information is imparted in these classes. You just don't get from the sermons while you can become more of a leader. And we are going to continue that as God makes that possible. So we're going to have a bigger work on television, a much bigger work on the internet. We're going to have the Living University coming along, and we're going to have these public Bible lectures, such as Mr. Fannin is conducting this very weekend. We've had those all over the country and all over the world. They've got to increase, increase in power and scope, everything. We're going to have to do that, and all of us think about it, pray about it, get behind it. Brethren, three big events, and I hope all of you pay attention to this, three really major events have got to occur at the end of this age. Event number one, a more dynamic work, a powerful and dynamic work of Christ must be done. And I've already explained that. We've got to reach the whole world where they know who we are. And this is going to require a church somewhere, some part, some branch of God's church has got to be on fire to do that kind of work. We have all these little groups here and there that just want to meet at home and just have peace and don't have anyone tell them what to do. Well, of course, they're not preparing to be kings and priests because they don't even interact with people. They're not learning the lessons that they ought to learn to be part of a team which Christ is preparing to help rule this world under Jesus Christ in tomorrow's world. So they are not able to be able to be, to be prepared for the job they will be doing because they're not even worshiping together and they're not getting behind the work that Christ is doing today. Secondly, the great, second great major event, there must be, must be a much more powerful prophetic events. We all know that. Much more powerful drought, famine, no doubt riots, food riots, water riots, all kinds of things like that are going to be raging in our streets, frankly, over the next five or ten years. I don't think we like to think about that, but that's probably going to happen. And we're going to find, of course, more disease epidemics and, and great earthquakes. In Luke 21, it says great earthquakes, not just normal earthquakes. Those are going to get worse and worse 
over the next five to ten years or less. Then we're going to find this United States of Europe, this European Union, which is kind of wobbling along, and they're having a lot of problems right now because they can't fully get together in their economic situation, and they can't get along fully in any of the other situations for that matter, and they may come apart. And frankly, at the very time they come apart may be the most dangerous time because then a strong man will come up and maybe a powerful religious leader too, and then they will re-emerge building on the foundation they've already built. They've already got a lot of systems in place so they can quickly use those systems to back this, uh, uh, this more integrated beast power, and that beast will rise up quickly because so much preparation has already been done, and that is going to happen. That is going to happen too within the next five to 10 years probably, five to 15 years may be better to be safe, I guess, but these things certainly are coming along. So we're going to see that happen and we're going to see a dynamic false prophet. You read about that, of course, in, in Revelation chapter 13 and verses 11 to 13 right along on there describe how he's going to literally bring down fire from heaven. And when you have a false prophet bringing down fire, people are going to see this is the great power of God like they did in Acts chapter 8 for Simon Magus, the first leader of that system that the Bible talks about. But that's going to happen. We're living in an exciting time. Most of the world makes fun of the idea of spirit beings. They don't believe in a real God and they don't believe in a real devil and they don't believe in real spirit beings who are demons. But uh, these events are going to make a believer out of most of them because these events are going to happen within the lifetimes of most of you. And so that's going to be very exciting. And then we're going to see these nations gathering around Egypt and Saudi Arabia and one of those countries will probably produce the king of the south because those are the nations south of uh, Jerusalem. And the Bible nearly always uses directions from that point of view. So I know there's one false prophet who says it's going to be Iran. It is not going to be Iran. I'll just go on record. Iran is not the king of the south and not going to be the king of the south. Iran is northeast of Jerusalem and that is false. But the king of the south will be south of Jerusalem. Probably the leader will be the either from Egypt which it has normally been. Uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser was in charge of this big group before, and uh, or Saudi Arabia if it becomes heavily religiously influenced. One of those nations down that direction, south of Jerusalem, and you're going to see that coming together. And that'll be exciting to watch. It gives us a lot to watch in world events, frankly, specific things. Thirdly, the third major event is somewhere, somewhere on this earth, God's true servants, one branch of the true church of God is going to be so dedicated and so on fire for God that they will be given more power than any church of God has had for hundreds of years as far as the gifts of the Holy Spirit to heal the sick, discern spirits, cast out demons, and that type of thing. And I think you'll see that too. Again, you younger people will because I'm sure that's going to be done. Otherwise, brethren, people wonder... Uh, actually who God really is, is there a real God and are there real spirit beings and is there a real church and all that kind of thing. You see God has to intervene at some point to help get their attention and make them realize this stuff is real. Otherwise to them it's just a lot of religious arguments. But if they see and hear about it, they're not going to be converted. Don't think, I'm not saying they're all converted. Most of them won't be. Here was the very Son of God, Emmanuel, Jesus Christ, performing miracle after miracle all up and down Israel, you know. And were all the people converted? No, they killed him. <laughs> that was his reward. They killed him. They didn't believe him. Well, the common people, often thousands, tens of thousands, did believe him, but the religious leaders were able to twist their minds and get them to crucify him. So they, they weren't converted, but that was a powerful witness so that after he died, you did begin to have tens of thousands of people coming in. 3,000 were baptized the very first day of Pentecost after Christ's death. 3,000 at one time. Was that all because P Peter had such a powerful sermon that day? No. It was because of the three-year ministry of Christ, all those miracles, all those other things, suddenly it came rushing back into their brain. This thing is real. 
I have a cousin who saw Christ. I have a neighbor who said he saw Christ. He said it says he was seen by over 500 brethren at once. And so a lot of people had some knowledge of the fact he was resurrected from the dead when he was. And that must have had a tremendous impact. You just see that all the way through the back, uh, book of Acts. As you read the early book of Acts, the early chapters, there's this constant theme. You know, he is risen. He is risen. God resurrected him from the dead. And they were just ecstatic about that. So home, somewhere on this earth, a true church is going to have a powerful work but they're also going to be given the gifts of the Spirit to lift them out of just the morass of people all saying, well, we're here, we're all the same, there isn't any difference. And God will begin to show that. Brethren, we here, and you brethren who will hear this, this sermon is being prepared for the fast day. It will be prepared on the fast, uh, preached or uh, given, I should say, played the tape on the fast day. This is the church that ought to be doing that. I can't say for sure we will be. I think we will be, of course, at the rate we're going and the basic attitude. But we could let down our guard. God says, he that thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. <clears throat> so we must not get puffed up. We are not there yet. We have not finished our course. We have not done that kind of work yet. And many of us are still very, very weak, including me. I'm very weak. I have been out doing some horrible thing and by the world standards, but you know, I know I'm not as close to God when I read about Christ and the way he lived and the Apostle Paul. I need much more zeal and much more passion throughout every day for God and God's word and the kingdom of God. And frankly, so do virtually all of you. If some of you don't need more of that, why, uh, well, please raise your hand. I'd like to meet you. <laughs> I'd like to meet you. <laughs> anyway, I think we all understand we need that very, very much. And we should be the one to have these signs. We should be the one to do this powerful work because we have in our church, and at the beginning we had more of the older men, including Mr. Debar Pardin and myself and Mr. Raymond McNair and Carl McNair and, and Dr. Uh, uh, Lochter and Mr. Sid Hegel, all teachers and ambassador, and many other very dedicated older men who'd worked right with Mr. Armstrong for years. We had more of those come with us than any other group on earth, and we helped him build the work back during the 50s and 60s. And so we, we can carry on that work, of course, because we helped do it in the first place if we yield to God. We have that understanding. We have that pattern in our minds. And we can carry on if we do our part. In Matthew 24, 14, another verse backs up what I've been saying. Jesus said here, he, verse 13, he who endures to the end shall be saved. And verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom the gospel of the coming kingdom or government of God will be preached, not might be, will be preached in all, uh, to all nations as a witness. And then the end will come. So it will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. So this gospel has got to go out to all the world as a witness to all nations. Jesus said that. That's what he said very clearly. This is the word of God and that is going to happen. So somewhere on earth someone's going to really do that to all the nations to do it powerfully enough that it is a witness. We have a little tiny fringe of people that know about us in some of these countries but they have certainly not been witness to enough to say we finished the witness. And I know that. I'm not trying to say we finished the work. I'm grateful, you know, for what God has done thus far. We can be grateful, but we're just puny. We're tiny. We're not just the little flock. We're the tiny flock. <laughs> Always amuses me to come to a, a work site when we were in, uh, uh, still living in, uh, in uh, San Diego on Salata Lane. Why there were people coming. They were having to redo some of the stucco or something around all the houses that wasn't done just right in this development. And uh, they, they, the foreman was named Tiny. And I knew before I met him what he was going to look like. He was about 6'6 six, six and about three or 400 pounds. <laughs> Most of these great huge guys get the nickname Tiny. That's kind of cute. <laughs> Tiny's not so tiny. But we're not tiny. We really are tiny. And we've got to get bigger, of course. And God will help us do that again if we do our part. 
Let's go back to Amos now, brethren, again about this matter of preaching the message and what God said about it. Amos chapter 3, and again, this is God's word, and Jesus refers to the book of Amos, and other New Testament writers do. It's inspired. Amos chapter 3, verse 6, If a trumpet is blown in the city, will not the people be afraid? If there is a calamity in a city, will not the eternal, will not the ever-living one have done it? Isn't God in charge over all? Surely the Lord God does nothing except he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets. If there's any major significant thing, the servants of God will know about it. A lion has roared. Who will not fear? The eternal God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? We've got to prophesy. We've got to carry this message out and warn our people of the coming great tribulation and warn the other nations of the world of the final end time events that are coming and also be a witness to them in a very loving but powerful way. This world needs right government, my friends, and tell them that. And most of you know that we could tell them. And there's going to be a government that's going to give you clean water and clean food and a decent government, not a corrupt government that comes in and takes your property and rapes your wives and daughters and crushes you and puts you in jail like you have in so many of these dictatorships and so on. A good government. It's coming. It's coming. And we're proclaiming that message. So that's what we've got to do. If we don't do it, Christ will get someone else to do it. So let's be sure our heart's in that. In Proverbs chapter 24, turn with me there if you would, Proverbs now, chapter 24, is again right in the middle of this book on wisdom, yet it's a prophetic thing here that's very unusual. Proverbs 24, verse 10, If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. So there's a time coming time of terrible trouble and adversity. Deliver those who are drawn toward death. Hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. When is the greatest slaughter in human history going to take place? Probably in the next 5 to 25 years. Probably closer to 5 than to 25. The coming great tribulation. And then the day of the Lord including the seven last plagues. I mean, that's just awful, the things when you read about it, and it's real. God says so. As I said, brethren, I, I sometimes when I read this, I think, would a loving God do that? And people think, would a loving God do that? And yet you read about Idi Amin there in Uganda and the butchery and the terrible things he and his troops did. And you read about this uh, modern leader in uh, Zimbabwe, how he's causing the people to be starving to death and crushing the enemy and his troops going out doing there and these roving gangs in the Congo and how they're using mass rape as a weapon of war and raping tens and tens of thousands of women just to simply humiliate the enemy and crush them. It's a horrible thing. It's happening right now while we speak all over this world, brethren. We need to understand the world we're living in. That kind of thing may be unleashed a little bit on this nation at the very end, and I hope we're at a place of safety by the time it gets that bad. But let's understand. How is a loving God uh, going to uh, speak to those people and get their attention? <laughs> I think you know. He will have a way to get their attention. Like a father takes his son, his really rebellious son, out to the woodshed and he has a chance to get his attention with a great big board. <laughs> uh, God is going to have a great big board and he's going to chasten us as we have never been chastened and he will shake the nation just like you'd shake a rag doll. He's got to do that. He doesn't hate these individuals, but he's got to stop them from their devilish practices. And these big, strong, powerful, arrogant dictators they're not going to listen to Hillary Clinton running around and, and uh, talking to them, sweet talk, and say, let's talk. They're not going to pay attention at all. They'll just laugh, and that'll buy them more time to get their atomic and hydrogen weapons underway and all that kind of thing. Our nation hasn't yet figured that out. But th this is going to have to be done by the God of heaven, and he is going to shake the nations in that way. That's why he has to do that. He will rule the world with a rod of iron and uh, he's going to do it for a purpose because that's the only way those people will listen. So brethren, think about this. 
if these people are stumbling to the slaughter today in our society, if you say, surely we did not know this, does not he who weighs the hearts consider it? He who keeps your soul, does he not know it? And he, will he not render to each man according to his deeds? God is going to bless each one of you or render to you, not necessarily blessing, blessing or cursing as it may be, according to your deeds. Unto whom much is given, of him shall much be required. More is required of me because I came to Ambassador College as a 19-year-old kid and had that opportunity. I know that. The first man I baptized, I think it was the first man, I don't want to make up a story, but one of the first men was named A.M. Coffin, and he was 84. I was 21, and he was 84. And I realized later that he could not lay up the same amount of treasure in heaven than I did by the deeds he did, and yet God will judge him by what he did during the time he had. And he was uh, back near Fort Worth, Texas, and later he got a wealthy man to help him fly out to Pasadena, and I actually took him around. Mr. Armstrong let me use the college car, and we went out to old areas that are now all built up now, and Reseda, and, and uh, forget all these places out there, out west toward the, and they, he got Nubian goats. He'd buy Nubian goats and fresh Nubian goat milk and ship the goats back for the uh, veterans hospital there near Fort Worth. He thought that would help these soldiers who'd given their lives or their bodies for our country. He was doing good, clear up to the day he died. He did go ahead and come to the feast, clear up until he was 86 or 88 or whatever he was when he finally died. <clears throat> so he laid up treasure while he was here. God judges each of you that way. You don't have to all be preachers. But you want to do the best you can with what you have to do with to get this message out. You know what's going to happen if you follow the Bible, if you follow the preaching of God through Herbert W. Armstrong going clear back to 1934 and followed our preaching. And we've been preaching these things now in this work for over 16 years. I've been preaching these things for just personally doing it for about 60 years and because uh, I was already preaching and writing in my senior year of college. So these things have happened that we've talked about or are beginning to happen, and they're very, very real. They're affecting the major events, the major nations, I mean, to this world, and we need to understand. So will he not render to every man according to his deeds? You see these people stumbling to the slaughter. They need our help. They need a work to reach out to them. Fellow Americans, please wake up. Your house is on fire. And we've got to help them some way to wake up and understand. And I hope God gives us the opportunity to do much, much more of that. So let's understand. Brethren, if we grow in faith and give ourselves to God, uh, we will be the ones with these powerful signs that God is going to do at the end of the age. And one thing while we're here, I want to have this uh, because we're going to have tie this in, of course, with the fast, and that's one reason we should be fasting, and a very important reason. Back in Mark chapter 9, Mark, the Gospel of Mark chapter 9, do you remember the story there about how Jesus' disciples were not able to heal this young man who was struck by this spirit and seized him and threw him to the ground, and he foamed at the mouth, verse 18, and... Uh, the disciples could not cast him out. Verse 19, Jesus answered, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? Bring him to me. And then the spirit convulsed and the man, young man wallowed and fell on the ground. And finally, Christ cast out the demon. The father said, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. He was desperate. He didn't have perfect faith, but he did need help. And so Jesus answered. And when the people came running together, verse 25, he rebuked the unclean spirit. See, you don't talk to the, to the man or the woman. You talk to the demon inside the person. That's who you're talking to. He said, you deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsive greatly, came out, and he became as one dead. He went into kind of a, a convulsion there so that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him. But the hand lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast him out? Why? 
Let's think about that, brethren. Why aren't we having more of the gifts of God's Spirit? He said this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. And if you have some new translation that doesn't have the word fasting in, that is wrong. It is in the majority text. It's in the major Greek text that was preserved by God. It's in the old King James. The new King James belongs in the Bible. This kind comes out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Fasting is a tool to cause us to humble ourselves, to focus more fully on the realization of how short our life is, how much we need God, how human we are, and especially if you use fasting the right way. Now, when I was first being converted, I didn't always do it perfectly. I didn't understand. And sometimes, you know, you just sort of tough it out, and then the day would be over. And then you'd go to the Western whole, whole uh, Steakhouse over on the, uh, <laughs> on uh, what's his place there, and, and pass it in and have a great big steak. And this great big steak sits there in your stomach, and you can hardly think because you haven't had any food all day, and then you put this great steak in there. And that's not the way, of course. The best way is to ease up on your eating before you go into the fast. And then during the day of fasting, uh, get a little extra sleep if you can, and spend extra time, a lot of extra time, studying and meditating. Think about what they God, I'm here, you're up there. Somehow you've opened my mind to the fact that you are the real God and here I am on this earth and I'm in your church and I know your truth. Help me to understand. Help me to draw closer to you. What is the meaning of these words I'm reading? And then you pray to God. Study, meditation, and pray, a prayer all through that day, asking God, help me, guide me, cleanse me, purge me, fashion me, mold me, help me really become like you are in every way. That attitude should be in your heart and mind during the day of fasting. And then you'll sense in the weeks to follow, you'll have more of God's spirit. You won't become a superman all of a sudden. I don't mean that, but I know that it does help if you do it that way. So anyway, God says this kind of thing can come about nothing but by nothing but prayer and fasting. And so we do need to fast. And if we want the gifts of the Spirit, if we want all these things I'm talking about, we had better spend time fasting. Now, brethren, let's turn back to Mark chapter 6 at this point. In Mark chapter 6, we find something about this theme too that's very, very important. And I want you to begin reading here with me in verse 1. Mark 6, verse 1. Then Jesus went out from there, came to his own country, and when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach. And they said, well, who's this? He just grew up here, and we know his family. And Jesus said, verse 4, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. And that's true. In your own house and among your own family, you're not regarded as anyone great because they know your human faults and frailties. And that's a normal thing. And even more so when you go way back to where you grew up. I remember going back after I was ordained an evangelist. I was very young. And I went back home and sometimes I'd see my mother and some of her friends. And here I was, you know, God's evangelist, 23 years old or 25 or whatever. And some of these older men, women, I mean, would come up and they say, Oh, we remember you, Roderick. We changed your diapers. I'd say, Oh, no. <laughs> I wasn't very impressive to them. <laughs> they babysat me as a little boy. <laughs> How could I impress them? Well, you know, those were very nice ladies, I'm sure. They're not here now, and so I can impress people more if I go back home because I'm older than they are, but I haven't been back to Joplin for two or three years. I hope I get a chance to go back another time. I won't meet any of these old ladies because if they're that much older than me, they'd have to be 100 or 110 years old, I guess. <laughs> Anyhow, so that's the way it is. You can't be a big shot in those areas where people knew you as a little boy. Now, he could there do no mighty work. What is this saying? It's saying that Jesus, the Son of God himself, could do no mighty work except that he laid his hands on a few, not very many, a few sick folk, and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And if you turn over to Matthew 13, just flip there, or write it in your margin. I won't turn there, but Matthew 13, 38, it says specifically they, 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 he could not do that because of their unbelief. It was not because of his unbelief, but their unbelief. 
and that's implied, of course, even in Mark's account, he marveled because of their unbelief. They did not have real faith. Now, brethren, that's the main problem now. There are probably two or three or five problems that we have today. One situation, and I understand this fully, is that God does certain things on a schedule and he may already have planned thousands of years ago to pour out his spirit and gifts of the spirit more powerfully the last year or two of the work just before the tribulation. And we aren't quite there yet. I understand that. So it's not necessarily that we're all bad. But also the Bible indicates that when people have a lot of faith, a radiant faith, the prayer of faith saves the sick. And God hears the fervent prayer of a righteous man. You know that back in James 5, verse 16. God will hear us if we're fervent and if we're obeying him. He will hear and he will intervene more than he would have done otherwise. Otherwise, why does he tell us to pray if it's all preordained and all going to be the same anyway? That is not the case. Prayer does make a difference. So if we cry out to God for more faith, and more love and more zeal for God's work and for the gifts of the Spirit that we can have an impact on this confused world. And boy, are they confused today, as you know. God will begin to give these gifts more than he would have done otherwise. And we all need to do our part. So it isn't just the ministry. Jesus was the minister, but he was not able to heal because of their unbelief. Not his unbelief, their unbelief. So it involves an atmosphere of faith. And you will find many times in the Bible that indication where there was a real atmosphere of faith, you would have more miracles. And so, brethren, as I mentioned in a sermon I gave about three months ago, I gave a split sermon, mentioned some of these things. We need to be building with God building it in us, actually, through his spirit, Christ building us in it, an atmosphere of faith in this church to build faith, feed on faith, feed on the Bible, talk about faith, think about faith, talk about faith, pray about faith. And if we do that, we will begin to have more faith and we will begin to have more healings. Now, some of the people in the church that are sick or ill are my age or older. They're up in their 70s or 80s or 90s. We still should pray for each other. I hope you'll keep on praying for me. I'm not asking you to quit just because I'm older. I just don't want people to, you know, lose their faith because if God lets some of us die if we're older. But I do want you to keep praying for them because God can prolong uh, people's lives very much. And he has done that and I'm sure will do that. But on the other hand, uh, you know, when people do get up that, we will have a number of our older brethren die. And that doesn't mean that God's gone off or, or something like that at all. That's, that's just normal, let's say, part of, uh, part of life. Anyway, let's understand that and really build an atmosphere of faith. Now turn over to verse 12. So they went out and preached that people should repent. What did they do first? They preached. Secondly, as he sent the disciples out, they preached that people should repent. Secondly, they cast out many demons, number two. And thirdly, they anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. These are the big three, as I've mentioned before. I won't try to go through all the other verses because it says it over and over. The big three. Jesus sent them out over and over. He told them. In Matthew 10 with the apostles, he told the 70 others also in Luke chapter 10, three things, preach the gospel, heal the sick, cast out demons, those three things. Remember that, that's what they were to do. Preach the gospel, heal the sick, cast out demons over and over and over. We need to do that more and we need to have within the church of God a greater atmosphere of faith. And if we do and build that and beseech Christ, please put more of your spirit within us. Put faith within us, church, Lord Jesus, and pray to God that we can have more faith. I'm sure God will hear us and he will begin to help us have more faith in the church. All right, let's turn now to Luke chapter 10. Here is not just the apostles. Some new people in the church or people from other churches say, as you know, they'll say, oh, well, that was all for the apostles. Oh, really? Let's see what it says in the Bible. Luke chapter 10. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others. 
beside the apostles, 70 others also, and sent them out two by two. 35 teams of probably younger men in their 20s or 30s or 40s. It could have been some older too, but that was normally the way. And so he told them to go out and preach. And he said as he went in verse 8, Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you, and heal the sick. So they were to eat what was given of the brethren, but the thing they were to do was to heal the sick and say to them, The kingdom of God has come to you. So they were to preach the kingdom of God and they were to heal the sick. You say, well, what about demons? Well, it doesn't somehow say that. Luke may have just somehow didn't leave, put that in until later, but they, they did do that. Verse 17, then the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. So they did cast out demons. Those three things, they preached, they healed the sick, they cast out demons. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you, who is the you? Seventy others also. I have given you authority to trample on the serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. See, these snakes and those poisonous uh, vipers represent Satan. And frankly, I don't want any of you to become snake handlers. We don't do that. But if God's word is true, and he indicates that as Mark 16 and elsewhere, God will protect us from those things if we have faith. I know that Raymond McNair and I, and later Burke McNair and I, and others of us in the early tours, we got right down in the swamps in East Texas and Louisiana at midnight sometimes and baptized people. We had to get a flashlight, and sometimes we'd hit the water and try to scare away any alligators or, or snakes or something. And we just prayed to God that God would protect us, and he always did. We, we had, I guess, a little kind of a brash faith that we might not have had as much later, but we just knew God was there, and he was there. He took care of us again and again and again, and he will. He's given you authority over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this. If God gives you power over uh, snakes or demons or healing, don't get puffed up about it. But rejoice rather that your names are written in heaven, that you can be a child of God. That's the thing to rejoice about. That's the big thing to God. God can give anyone all kinds of power to do something, but he is developing character. He cannot develop holy, righteous character in you or me by fiat. He just can't say, have character. That's not the way character is developed. True character, true Christian character is developed when we really come to understand God is real and Jesus Christ is the Son of God and we understand his message and then really genuinely repent, a heartfelt repentance and burial of the old self as a surrender to God and give our lives to God and really mean it, which many people do not do when they're baptized. Some need to be baptized again and have, make a real covenant. When you're baptized, you are making a covenant with your Creator, a genuine covenant where you have really repented and then God will give you the Holy Spirit and as you feed on God's Word, as you meditate on it, think about it, turn it over in, your, over in your mind and drink in of it. As you pray to God for help and strength, please help me live with this word. Please send Jesus to live within us. Let Christ be formed fully in me. And you ask God that, then Christ will be more fully formed within each of you. And you will reflect Jesus Christ more. He won't change your whole personality. Some people are more serious, some people are more uh, friendly, some people are more even silly, some people are more studious, some people are more musical. He doesn't change that bent, but he will give you love that's expressed in the normal part of your personality and outflowing concern and kindness and patience and self-control beyond what you have ever had before through his Holy Spirit, and you will grow to be like Christ. So anyway, you want to really understand that and draw close to God that this may be accomplished in each one of you. So that's the thing. Let's rejoice that our names can be written in heaven. Now back in, in Luke 18, turn to chapter 18 if you would, uh, we find some more information here about what we should be doing. 
Then Jesus spoke a parable, verse 1, that man should always pray and not lose heart. Don't give up and quit, saying there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God and regard man. Just a tough old guy, and he didn't uh, take bribes or he wasn't impressed with other people in that way. Now there was a widow in the city, and she came saying, Avenge me of my adversary. Well, he thought, This old woman, who's she? I won't bother with her. And he would not. But afterward, he said, finally, you know, he wasn't a te terribly cruel man. He didn't try to hurt her. He said, well, old uh, Josephine just keeps coming. I'm getting tired of this. I better do something. So he, he kept, she kept wearing him down. Though I don't, do not fear God in a regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will revenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. So she got his attention finally. She was patiently, humbly coming. He didn't have anything. He couldn't say anything bad about it. She just kept coming. Then the Lord said to us, Hear what the unjust judge said. And if the unjust judge says this, how much more would God do, if you see what I mean in this parable? And shall not God avenge his own elect? Listen, who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them. Brethren, do you personally cry out to God day and night, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Father, please send Jesus back. Please help us finish the work. Please help people wake up. Help us to do our part. Do you pray that way? I hope you do. But I doubt if very many of us do the way we, that Jesus wants us to. So think about those. Shall he not avenge us if we cry out Heartfelt prayer, crying out day and night, though he bears long with them. They keep coming, and he'll finally hear. Jesus indicates that. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? A rhetorical question, but the way it's worded clearly indicates, as even the commentaries and Greek scholars acknowledge, that Jesus was indicating there wouldn't be much faith. Will he really find faith? Indicating there wouldn't be much faith on the earth when Christ comes back. And that's a shame. But you can understand that. All of us can understand that. Here I grew up in the Methodist church and learned about God as an old father figure off in the sky and and Jesus is a little helpless baby and, and uh, we sing songs and, and Christmas things to Santa Claus and Rudolph the Red Rose Reindeer and, and uh, stuff like that. And then Easter comes and we have Easter egg hunts and then all the rest of the world is in confusion of that kind and worse, many of them. And they don't know the real God. They don't have any concept of the real God. And then we come into God's church and we're surrounded by television and the telephone and helicopters overhead. And we start to study and the phone rings. And uh, some of us don't even turn off our cell phones. Maybe the best thing would be to get in a, a sort of a semi-soundproof room and leave your cell phone somewhere else. I'm not kidding. Do something like that and begin to concentrate on the Bible. Say, God, I am going to concentrate on your word and feed on Christ, and I don't want anything. And you can tell your wife or husband or older child, bother me only if the house is burning down <laughs> or if there's some genuine emergency. I mean that. I've done that on occasion when I'm anointing the anointed clause for people and, and, uh, that they send in. I don't want Cheryl to run and say, well, someone's on the phone. I said, don't bother me unless the house is going to burn down or something like that. But we should do that kind of thing more often if we have to. You may not have to if you get up early and study or set time. But be sure you concentrate and focus on studying God's Word, reading it, read it aloud if need to, mumble it, mark it, go back over it again, think about it, feed on it, inculcate it into your mind, your heart, your very being, the Word of God, feeding on Christ. So when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Not very much. That's one reason we're not getting as many miracles as we should because this world has affected all of us more than we realize. Now let's turn to Mark uh, chapter 6 uh, again. Mark, uh, no, I'm part, sorry, this time Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, brethren. And uh, I want to uh, read something here. I think I did perhaps three months ago, but that's fine. This is the very end of Christ's ministry. Mark 16, verse 14. 
Afterward, that is after his resurrection and so on, he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who'd seen him after he had risen. Here he'd spent three years with them and performed all kinds of miracles. They just couldn't seem to believe that he'd actually come up again from the grave. You see, even his own disciples. He rebuked their unbelief. Will he rebuke your unbelief? Think about it. Each of you, will he rebuke your unbelief or my unbelief? Let's be sure that we build that part of our character more than we have. And he said, go unto all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes, you've got to believe that God is there. Believe that there is a real God and Christ is his son and these things are going to happen. And as baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned and the Greek word is one of these forms of anacrino, diacrino, which really can mean judged. It doesn't mean condemned, but judged. And that may be the better translation. They're not all judged or condemned, I mean, but they're going to later on be judged. And these signs will, not might, but will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. Now, we haven't had tongue speaking in uh, the living church of God. I think there may have been some genuine tongue speaking in the church at times, but i do not not familiar with it. The ones I've seen have all been uh, uh, fake. And uh, the people that got mixed up and left and didn't know God or anything else. The time may come, though, when there is genuine tongue, tongue speaking, and we should not be against that, but we do need to understand it. I, I may give, should give a whole sermon, but we've written on it, and so most of you read our old articles. Genuine tongue, tongue speaking is the capacity to supernatural, supernatural capacity to speak in a different language. It is not ecstatic utterance, as some of the people try to get into, or gibberish. When I was still very young and just coming into the truth, I attended two or three uh, evangelistic campaigns by Oral Roberts and people like that and A.A. A. A. Allen God's man of faith and power that's the way the guy said it on the radio <laughs> we went to his tent meeting and some of these guys out there in Southern California and they would uh, their people would speak in tongues they go, they go on for about five minutes and then the interpreter would come on and the interpreter would only talk for maybe two minutes <laughs> And the interpretation was a great light will come up from the east and there will be great joy and power will come to God's people. And then he'd finish. Well, you know, it just he would kind of piece together uh, phrases, kind of broken phrases from the Bible in an odd way that didn't mean anything. And that was supposed to be the interpretation. And then sometimes you would get a person, I remember a lady sitting uh, right back of me on this side and she was actually began to come under the spirit and she flopped her head I thought her head was going to come right off it was just going like that a, a, a demon grabbed hold of her I don't think she could have done that she was foaming at the mouth her, her eyes rolled back in her head it was terrible and a demon had her and those things do happen All right, there is spirit there there are spirit beings in the meetings but they are not God's spirit that is not God's spirit that does that. But you need to understand the difference. Some of the early apostles were able to, or members, to speak in a foreign tongue supernaturally. And that's what it's about. Not gibberish. There's no point in speaking gibberish. It was not that at all. But God may give some of us the power to speak in Chinese or Japanese or some other language before it's all over. I'm not saying he will, but certainly he has the power, and he may well do that if we're close to him. And we should pray that God would give more of us the genuine gifts of the Spirit. And they will take up serpents, so it doesn't mean we're to be snake handlers. You see, what is the one example? The Bible is the thing to focus on. What is the example of tongue speaking? You read it in the Bible, how they did it, and they were speaking about God's miracles. It wasn't something crazy. There in Acts chapter 2, it spoke about the great works of God. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Now, brethren, we have done that in the ministry in modern times far more than the other gifts. And we're very grateful for that. And I have told you uh, three months ago, and again, probably a year before that, three or four sermons I preached right here in Charlotte on healing and given you the examples of how God has healed in our time. 
how we had Howard Clark, who was just my age, but had been in the uh, Korean War and uh, was a quadriplegic, I guess you'd say quadriplegic, wouldn't you, Mrs. Murray? And he was in the wheelchair and couldn't move much of anything. And he just sat there, and uh, God just supernaturally healed him over Pentecost 1958 through the prayers of Dick Armstrong. It's kind of strange. God let Dick Armstrong die, who was one of my best friends, at age 29. And it shook us. But somehow, it's as though God was telling us, Dick's okay. He performed three miracles within about three months before he died. Unusual miracles. And that was the most remarkable one. All of a sudden, Howard Clark was completely healed. Then we had a woman, Mrs. Beam, who had breast cancer, and she was a sort of a prospective member. Her husband was in the church, but she wasn't. And one breast was completely removed by this big clinic in Salt Lake City and, and uh, specializing in that. It wasn't so what some chiropractor did. I'm not against chiropractors, but people get suspicious if you say, well, I, I went to a chiropractor or I, I had a cold and drank orange juice for a week and got well. Okay, you probably get well after a week if you didn't drink orange juice. You see what I mean? <laughs> We're talking about genuine healings. And so she had cancer, and the cancer then went in the other side, and uh, they had a whole relay of women taking care of her in the church, and all of a sudden, when things got horrible, I've told you the story, he, she was healed at the last minute. And I flew back and visited her. It was so remarkable. I wanted to see and ask her, and I asked her husband, and I asked these women. I said, you took care of her? And yeah, you know, I'm from Missouri. I just wanted to check it out. It was so remarkable. And then... I guess Raymond or Burke and I on the baptizing tour in the early 50s met this woman, I believe it was in Kansas, and her arm had been about one-third or one-fourth the size of a normal arm from the time she was born. And she came to meet us to be baptized. And she brought her Baptist lady friend because she was, she didn't know how old we would be, I guess. We were just 21 or 2. And she was about 40 or 45, but she, maybe she wanted a little uh, moral support in meeting these strange young men, you know, from Pasadena. So she brought her Baptist friend along with her, but this friend had grown up with her from childhood. After baptism, she told us she had no reason. She was not a Pentecostal. She'd be, oh, Lord, thank the Lord, ha, and all this stuff. We'd have been suspicious. She was very normal. She said, fellows, last winter, she said this arm was just hanging there ever since I was born. And I sent in for an anointed cloth for Mr. Herbert Armstrong and got the cloth and the arm began to grow right out within days or weeks, whatever it was. And she said now it was summertime and she held her arms out. She had short sleeved blouse on and she said, you see, it's completely normal now except the, the, the one, the bad arm, I think was her right arm, is not quite as big as the other. And she said, God healed the arm. It works perfectly, but he's letting me develop the muscles in the arm. She said, I see, now I can milk with both hands. She was a farm woman. And when she said that, tears came to my eyes. She just kind of got me. Now I can milk with both hands. And God is letting me finish the job. He's letting me finish building the muscles, but it works okay. So she was healed dramatically in a period of weeks. And I asked her friend, did you know her and her arm? Yeah, you know, she's always like that. Her her. Protestant for lady friend was very impressed, but she wasn't called yet. She didn't fall down at our feet and want to be baptized too, but she was very impressed that this supernatural healing should, took place. She knew it was real, and that was, that was encouraging, you know, to have that kind of second witness there. And, of course, uh, I told you about Dennis Brady's daughter, an older married student, and came to my freshman class while he was missing one time, and and uh, then he met me out in the hallway afterward. He said, Mr. Meredith, I'm sorry I couldn't be here for class. She said, my little daughter is dying of spinal meningitis. And I, ha I read the paper all the time, and I had read in the Los Angeles Times that a fatal variety of spinal meningitis was going around right then. And they had been to medical doctors and had blood tests and urine tests and the whole bit. It definitely was spinal meningitis. And the little girl was having convulsions and going like this and her fever was way up over 100 degrees and so on. He says, please, will you come and pray for her? So I did. And again, right after I prayed, they said she went completely to sleep and slept about 12 or 14 hours <laughs> peacefully. And they felt her the fever was gone even while she was sleeping. And then she woke up and felt good and wanted to eat. Since she was well, began to play. 
So God healed her right away, and I was very encouraged by that. I've had other healings like that, but that was one of the more remarkable. I could tell of others. We've had these healings, brethren, in God's church. Hundreds of them. Hundreds of them. Let me ask oh, you older members, some of you younger people, please look around. Do not lie. Don't anyone, you don't need to exaggerate, but how many of you older members who've been in the church, how many of you have had personally or know a close family member or friend that you know was healed supernaturally? Raise your hands. The rest of you look around. So it's not everybody, but we have about 15 or 20. Thank you very much. So these things do happen, and we're not trying to get sentimental or hoop and holler about it. It's just something that, that does happen. So we are very, very grateful. Anyway, they will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ, and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere the Lord that is the Lord Jesus Christ, the living head of the church, working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. You see, it's so much more effective if you have these miracles occurring from time to time. And I ask you to join me in a crusade that God will begin to put these gifts within his church, within his ministry, and give all of us the faith so we can build an atmosphere of faith so God will do this. We've got to draw close to God. We've got to cry out to God day and night. That won't hurt us. That won't hurt you. It might hurt you at first. You're not used to it, you know. But in your heart, you know, it'll make you closer to God. Your creator will help you to grow. Cry out to God for that and ask God to do that. And then God will certainly bless us and bless his work and, and all that kind of thing. So we do need to understand. Notice back here in Mark 6 again, turning to Mark 6, something here that I have mentioned many times. A very important thing. It says here in Mark chapter 6 and over near the end we were reading earlier but it shows here in verse uh, 43 they had well he had multiplied the fish and the loaves and they all ate and were filled and they took up 12 baskets full and those who had eaten were 5,000 and Matthew explains 5,000 men beside women and children so there may have been 10 or 20,000 there. And so he went across the sea and he departed to a mountain to pray while the others were out on the boat. In the middle of the evening he came, in, uh, you know, uh, to them. He was alone praying to God and he saw them while he departed to a mountain to pray. That's the key, verse 46. He may have prayed for hours. And finally in the middle of the night he began to walk on the sea. He was very close to God and they, they were just on the out on this boat and the wind was against them and he started walking there on the sea and would have passed them by and they were afraid and he said be of good cheer it's me and then verse 51 he went up into the boat the wind ceased right then like the turning off a big fan the wind just stopped here was God in the flesh walking on the sea and they were astonished it's me don't be afraid and when they, then they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled, for they had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened. What do you mean they had not understood about the loaves? If they had fully grasped what Christ did when he multiplied the loaves and fed over maybe 10,000 people, they would have realized here was a remarkable servant of God, here was the Messiah. Perhaps they would have literally understood there was God in the flesh. Of course he could multiply the loaves. Of course he could walk on the water. Of course he could do anything. It doesn't make any difference. Nothing is impossible with God. That's the thing we've got to understand. That is our God. That is our Father. Of course he could walk on the water. But they had not understood the reality of these things. And many of us in our day don't either. We just read it and so we hear people make fun of all this. Jonah, follow, Jonah swallowing the whale, you know, on these comedy shows and stuff. The way people make fun of the Bible. And pretty soon we take it all with a grain of salt. Don't take the Bible with a grain of salt. 
That's my advice to you. This is the word of God, and these things the Bible talks about are real. God's laws are like the law of gravity. They're every bit as real. You break them, and they will break you. And these prophecies that he has given, they are going to happen. They have happened. They are happening, they, or they will happen, and, and they're real. So we want to believe that God says what he means and means what he says. That's very, very important. So brethren, let's understand that we need to draw close to that great God and have this atmosphere of faith and not forget the loaves and the fishes, <laughs> what Jesus already did. Let's not forget about Mrs. Beam, who was healed of her breast cancer. Let's not forget about Dick Armstrong healing Howard Clark and how hundreds of us saw him afterward. Hundreds! Let's not forget about Dennis Brady's daughter. Let's not forget about the lady with the withered arm. God has done these things in our age. Let's not forget. And let's understand and have the right atmosphere of faith. So let's really cry out for these three big things to happen, brethren, that need to happen. Number one, Let's cry out that we may be part of the true church of God that does a really powerful work. And every one of us get involved in our prayer and helping others and our tithes and offerings and crying out to God. Help us do a powerful work. Secondly, we want to ask God over and over to intervene and to send Jesus back as King of kings and Lord of lords. And as you turn to Revelation, I had one little reference on, on that as you turn to Revelation 22. Revelation chapter 22, verse 7, John writes, here speaking, of course, Jesus is speaking in the first person, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Then you read down in verse 12. Again, Jesus speaking, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. What is your work? How much are you participating in the work of God? And then at the very end, verses 20 and 21, the last two verses in the entire Bible, he who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Do we pray that way? Come quickly, Lord Jesus. We cry out to Christ day and night and want these things to happen. So we should pray for these events to occur that people may know there is a real God, that they may begin to realize that we're the servants of God as we preach these prophecies and that they may be willing to listen. Number three, the third big event is to pray for faith. Ask God to help us build an atmosphere of faith and to grant us the accompanying signs. Faith and divine healing and the power to discern spirits, to cast out demons, and do these things that men may know that there is a real God, and that God has true servants on this earth, and they will really begin to listen. More will listen, far more will listen, if we have those signs. In Hebrews 10, beginning in verse 35, Paul is writing to the old timers, in a sense, those in the Jerusalem church in that area. He says, verse 35, <clears throat> Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. Don't ever give up and quit. Don't cast it away. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. I know it seems like a long time. I know that, brethren. It seems like a long time for me to have this stroke and sit here and stumble around on my cane and want to get up and, and uh, run up, run to the track and do all the other things I like to do. But it's getting to the end of this age. And from God's point of view, a year is a thousand years. From one point of view, as he breaks down an individual year, he can see all the things that happen every second all over the earth. But from the other point of view, a thousand years is like a day. And so he's coming pretty quickly from his point of view. From the timetable of eternity, he's going to be here real quick. And we need to understand that. Yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. <clears throat> That's what we have to do, to live by faith. <clears throat> 
But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. We must not draw back. We must walk with God, walk with Christ, and walk with our hand and their hand right on over into the kingdom of God. That's what he wants us to do. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. So brethren, let's pray for these three major things to happen. And let's pray that God will give us the faith, the understanding, and the courage to do our part, and to do our part with zeal, that we can lay up treasure in heaven and that when Christ comes back he can say well done good and faithful servant we know you went all out you were part of the church that was on fire and preparing the way for my second coming let's be that church